Welcome to my suburbanish, urbanish, sustainable homestead here in St. Petersburg, Florida. My name is Rob Greenfield and a lot of you know me for doing some pretty extreme things. Whether it's the tiny house that I built out of all secondhand materials where I grew and foraged all my food for a year in Orlando, Florida, or the off the grid tiny house I lived in in San Diego, California, or many of my other projects, a lot of them I take sustainable living and minimalism to the extreme. But today I'm excited to show you what I've been doing for the last six months at this homestead. Because what I've designed here is really designed to be very accessible, something that you can do, something that you can adapt into your life. But to take it a step further, this is a homestead that's designed for either a family or a group of people to come together and do to really be able to live sustainably and really step outside of the consumeristic system to a larger degree. And so the idea here is living quite sustainably in the city and it's focused on, besides sustainable living, being able to come together to reduce the amount of money that's needed to live, uh, to live more communally connected to other people, and then lastly, to live in service to your community. And that's what we've been doing here for the last six months. That's what I'm excited to give you a tour of today and share this with you. So we'll start by checking out the inside, then we'll head back outside to the gardens and to all the outdoor good stuff. So come on in. Now one of the first things you might notice as I was walking through the door is that it's the middle of the summer in Florida and we have the doors open, which means the air conditioning is not on. And I've strived to live without air conditioning for you know pretty much most of my life. Um, and I will say that I've been really happy that we've managed to mostly avoid the air conditioning, but we have used it some. We're trying to not be perfect. As I've lived alone in you know these tiny house settings, I've been able to live kind of exactly the way that I want to. But living in a more communal setting with a lot of people, it's been a, a different situation of uh, you know having to work uh, and make things work for each individual person's needs. But with that being said, really amazingly, really happily, um, it's almost July 1st and we've managed to use the air conditioning for just a small fraction of the summer so far and been able to use just the, the beautiful breeze that nature provides us as much as possible. Now, another thing you'll notice about this house is it's like your standard box of an American style building. To me, honestly, this style of house really sucks the soul right out of me. So I'm really working with what I had available to me and really working with what other people have available to them to be able to show, what, uh, to, to show this example of sustainable living in the city. Now the next thing that you'll notice around me is that it's pretty minimalistic. It's pretty simple and that's one of the themes that you'll see throughout this place is that when I design things, I'm designing them uh, in, a, in a way that is pretty clutter free, pretty free on the mind. I believe in the saying a cluttered space is a cluttered mind. And what you'll see here in this design of communal living is things that really flow and take care of themselves. So this is the living space here. Um, we know we just have a couple of basic futons on the ground, but I'm going to show you something over here. And this is one of my favorite things, and that's our seed library. We've just taken an old desk and transformed it into a library full of seeds and we've got uh, you know 100 or so different style, style of vegetable seeds here that I share through thousands of people through our free seed libraries and our free seed project here in our free seed project we've got all your basics like chives and carrot and arugula and dill and herb mixes and flower mixes and kale and uh, we send them out to, this year we sent seeds to 10,000 people through our free seed project where they receive about 20 varieties of seeds to start their own wonderful gardens and we provide those to people who uh, wouldn't otherwise have funds or access to have seeds. So you'll see that the theme of this place is it's really about designing a place where we can be of service. Uh, over here is our sort of our office area so as you can see pretty simple got a couple of computers set up. We do video production. We run our community programs. We had 10 people living here during the first three months as part of an internship that I was doing. This is the team and during that time we built 10 gardens for the people. 
We planted 30 community fruit trees in the neighborhood. We sent over 10,000 free seed packs out. We rescued about 5,000 pounds of food via our food rescue program. And then we also diverted about 500 plus pounds of food through our community compost program, as well as volunteering a lot in the community. So what you'll see about this place is it's really designed as a place to live simply so that we can live in service. Um, so on that note, I'm gonna show you the one of the bedrooms um, so you can kind of see the setup that we have going there. Come on in. So I've slept in this room. It's a room that was a room that I was in myself for a little while. And the idea that I want to share with you is this idea of uh, more communal living. I'm not going to call it, it's not, you know, an eco village and it's not uh, an intentional community. It's not to that level, but it is communal living. And the idea is the more that we can share resources, the less we need to money, the less money we need to earn, the less we need to be focusing on, uh, you know, material possessions and financial wealth by coming together. And so one of the ideas that I want to share with you that this place represents and this place has been is imagine if five of your friends and you get together and you share a house and maybe the rent is $2,000 a month. Split that with five people, you're looking at $400, which means instead of focusing on money, you can be focusing on being of service, like all of the programs. So you can see it's pretty simple in here. We've got a couple of dressers. You know, we got most of this stuff secondhand on places like Craigslist and, and Facebook Marketplace and things like that. Um, you can see some bunk beds here. Um, bunk beds are a really efficient way. Uh, again, it's simple living but there's so much benefit to simple living um, by cutting back the amount of things that we need, the more we can take power back from corporations that are trying to sell us on this idea that we need so much from them and that we can't get it working together. So I'm gonna show you one of the bathrooms right here. Pretty simple, pretty basic. And um, again, this place is kind of for me, sort of a fancy place. It's not my ideal living scenario. Not too much different from your typical house. So this bathroom obviously has a flush toilet in it, but outside we built a compost toilet and that's where I have been going and I'm excited to show you that. And that's something that numerous people in the house have been using. So really excited to get to outside to show you the things that I'm a little bit more passionate about with sustainable living. But before that, I wanna take you over to the kitchen because Food is, you know, the center of our lives. It's one of the main ways that we interact with the earth and one of the main ways that we have an impact for better or for worse. Um, another thing to mention just before getting in the kitchen, this is our dining area. We had quite a few communal meals here. One of the really nice things with living in community is sharing chores. So we have our chore sheets here where everybody has a different chore for the week and we share in these responsibilities and imagine living on your own and having to cook every single night now imagine instead living with six seven people where each person can cook dinner one night a week and you only have to cook dinner one night a week and have a nice meal that's these benefits of communal living that's where you can drastically reduce the amount of work you have uh, by working with others and living in community now of course Communal living has its own challenges. Sharing a bedroom with others has its own challenges and you don't have your own space. Um, but it's all, about, it's all about balance and it's all about asking what do you really want out of life? And I think this is one model to be able to achieve a more sustainable, equitable, just way of living. Um, most of the entire house was furnished secondhand. We got this, we got this table, which honestly is a, too fancy of a table for me. We got this thing for 50 bucks, including all of the chairs on Craigslist. So we have three main ways that we feed our household. Uh, what you're seeing here is our bulk food section. This is one of the most sustainable and economic ways to feed a group of people or an individual. We buy a lot, of, all of our staples. So, you know, your spices and your herbs, your teas, your oils, your nuts and seeds, your popcorn, raisins, your, your grains, uh, your beans, your, your uh, oatmeal and your flour. 
We buy all of this in the, in the bulk food section of the grocery store and there's many of these all across the United States and we bring our own bags and our own containers and we can actually fill up and so it's a pretty much zero waste way of, of, of uh, attaining a pretty good portion of our food. It's also one of the least expensive ways to eat and the key is cooking. If you take the time to cook it's a lot less expensive. So this is where a good portion of our food comes from. Secondly, we started a food rescue program where we actually would pick up the food from a local grocery store that they would normally throw in the dumpster that's still good, but they just, if you know about our, our food system in the United States, is there is way too much of it. And so we rescue that food and that's the way we got about 70% of the food for the household, which meant eating very inexpensively while diverting food from the landfill. So another fairly sustainable way to eat. And then lastly, of course, growing some of our own food. Now, with this being a new project and starting here with, you know, no gardens at the beginning, it takes time to be able to do that. When we arrived, the place was definitely in a state of disarray. It had been overgrowing for years. There was tons of trash left over from previous remodels, and there was just tons of stuff that had accumulated from the previous renters that had lived there. So we had to get to work right away to transform the place. And one of the things that we did is we organized volunteer days. So dozens of volunteers came out and helped us transform the place. And in exchange for their work, they got to learn how to transform their own place as well through permaculture, as well as got to meet many like-minded people. It wasn't just work, it was a community coming together for this project. One of the big things that we did is we replaced all of the lawn, all of the grass with mulch to turn it into gardening spaces and to turn it into habitat. We opened up space to bring in sunlight so that we could grow food. And as much as possible, we kept the organic matter on site in order to build soil. Within a couple of months, the place was transformed quite a bit. But with the focus on perennials, it takes a couple of years to really establish the garden. But in six months' time, it's pretty amazing how much we were able to accomplish. This is a pumpkin, for example. We got some squashes as well. Um, and not only eating from our gardens, but these are all mangoes that we foraged in the neighborhood. There's food growing freely and abundantly all over the place. And these are mangoes that all would have gone to waste without us harvesting them. So we have a community fridge that's part of our food rescue program. We don't just feed ourselves. We actually fed the community as well through that program. And I'm gonna show you that. Before we head out there, just as important as our food is our water. And in a lot of cities, the water is really polluted. It's often pretty toxic. And so it's important to have pure water, good, clean drinking water. So we use a Berkey filter, and I've been using these since my first tiny house in uh, San Diego. And I think they're one of the greatest systems because you can just fill this with a pitcher from the sink and it is one of the best at removing impurities, heavy metals, and uh, also removes chlorine. It can remove fluoride as well with fluoride filters. So you put pretty dirty city water into there, not dirty, but toxic, and it comes out as a really good drinking water. And they're, really, they're pretty inexpensive. They have nothing to set up. And so this is something that I really recommend for living more sustainably and healthfully. Absolutely no need for bottled water whatsoever, of course. Um, so that's a really important thing. So speaking of water, we have our sink. And I wanna talk a little bit about some sustainable tips when it comes to water in the house. Now, when it comes to the water and sustainable living in this homestead, one of the things that I didn't actually accomplish was gray water. And that's as simple as changing the plumbing so that the water goes out to your landscape rather than to the sewer. And so every time you're using the sink, you can actually be growing fruit with your fruit trees. It's a fairly simple thing. There are legalities around it, but it's, uh, it's a very doable thing, but it's one of the things that I just did not manage to do. Um, however, what you can do is underneath your sink, you can simply unscrew the P-trap and put a five gallon bucket there and then take that water and dump it directly into your yard. It takes no infrastructure or anything of that sort. And one really important note is that when you're using gray water, 
you know, whatever toxins you're putting down the drain are going to your land. So the key is not having toxins. And in this house, um, what we use is uh, a biodegradable plant friendly soap. So this soap can go right out to the plants and it actually feeds them. And that means not having a toxic thing, even if this is still going to the wastewater treatment plant, you're not sending toxic stuff to the wastewater treatment plant because toxins don't just go away magically. Uh, they continue, they persist. So we use all gray water uh, plant friendly soaps in all of our uh, bathrooms and in the kitchen and really don't have toxins that we're flushing down the toilet like bleach and things like that. The same with our laundry detergent. So speaking of uh, technology and, and machines like laundry machines, one thing that you'll notice is that this this kitchen doesn't have a lot of electronics in it. This is where the dishwasher was. I took that out and put it in the garage and instead we have a few wash bins and this is a much more efficient usage of water. It doesn't use all the electricity. We hand wash. For me it's about simplicity and it's about getting back to the basics. Sure, some people might think that a washing machine is more efficient, but when you take into account all that's needed behind that globalized, industrialized system and what's going to happen to the washing machine when it's done and it's broken, the input is far more than the simplicity of connecting and doing dishes by hand. So we have minimal technology, um, not no technology, but minimal, and right here, this is where the microwave used to be. And now, instead of a microwave, I have a song by one of my favorite humans, Thich Nhat Hanh. And instead of it being a, you know, big piece of technology, it's a reminder that happiness is here and now and to be present in life. And that to me is very meaningful. So again, we have some technology, but it's about minimizing it and reclaiming our humanness, taking back power from these big corporations that want to suck our money out of us and keep us working endlessly. And instead, again, it's about working together with community, simplifying and living more sustainably. And that's really what you see in the design of this place. You'll also notice that there are no corporate logos or advertising inside the house. That's a very intentional choice in order to keep away the subliminal marketing and to take a break from the bombardment of materialism. We have garbage cans. I'm gonna show you into the garbage can and this hurts a little bit, but let's take a look. There's garbage in the recycling. There's been recycling in the garbage sometimes and that's been a challenge of living, you know, in a community. Um, however, the goal is definitely not to be zero waste. The goal is to drastically reduce the amount of trash that we're making. And a lot of the trash that we do make actually comes from our food rescue program, stuff that would have already been thrown away. So the key really is that we don't have to do a perfect job, but we, you know, if the times that we're living in, we know that we have to strive for more and we have to strive for a lot more. What you will see and what you'll notice though is there is no food waste, no biodegradables in this garbage can. And that right here, we keep a, a bucket inside the house and we simply bring this out when it's full and swap it out with a clean bucket and then all food waste is composted to build healthy soil. So none of that is sent to the landfill. And you'll see we have instructions here for how to compost, recycle, and trash. And all of the food waste heads out to the garden where it is turned into soil. And I'm gonna take you out there. And on the way out, I'm also gonna show you the community fridge. So we're one step from outside in the garden. So just on the way out to the compost, I wanted to stop at our community fridge, which is in the garage. This is open for people to come in and out of. We have a select group of people that come and then they distribute this food out to more people in the community that don't otherwise have access to healthy food. Um, there's not a lot in here right now. It's uh, fairly empty uh, at this moment. It ebbs and flows. Sometimes it's stocked full and sometimes it's pretty empty. And um, the idea of this is that we are feeding our household through this food rescue program where we rescue the food that would have otherwise been thrown away from the grocery store. And at the same time, we have our community fridge where we've been able to distribute thousands of pounds of food to people in the community. Wow, and I'm actually being swarmed by mosquitoes right now in the garage. It's, it's really crazy. The Florida summers are difficult. Um, 
But so yeah, that's the community fridge. And then I want to show you another community thing right over here. And that's the community bikes. So these are our community bikes. And we had, what? One, two, three, four. We had about eight bikes here uh, before. But as we had less people, we downsized it. So we've got six bikes right now. And the idea is really simple. I mean, if you want to get away from the fossil fuels and you want to live more sustainably, then cycling is absolutely one of the biggest keys to that. And so we have these communal bikes where anybody living in the house can use them. And if we have guests over, we can use them. And having these bikes is absolutely key. And this little system of just hanging them on the wall is a really simple way to store them so that you maximize your space. So it is very hot out right now. I'm only wearing this shirt because we're filming. Otherwise, I wouldn't be wearing a shirt right now. That's kind of one of the keys to adapting is that when it's really hot, just minimal clothes as needed. Um, so this is our composting. We have two active compost bins here. Normally, what you see here would be filled with our carbon source. Now, to tell you just a little bit about composting, composting is just letting the earth do the work that it's always done. Putting our food in the landfill is saying to the earth, you can't do what you've always done. There's not oxygen there. That's not how things break down. It's toxic to the earth to put our food waste into a landfill. Instead, simply by putting it into a compost pile, you've got basically the trick is just for every bucket of food waste, you have about two buckets of a carbon source like wood chips, for example. It really is as simple as that. I mean, you can go really deeply complex with composting um, or you can keep it really simple and just let the earth do the work that it's done for a very long time. So from this compost spot, this is where all of our food waste is composted. It's where the compost from our food rescue program and our community compost program goes. But uh, we've rescued thousands of pounds of food waste, so we can't compost all of that here. And it's gone to other sites as well. Um, but the big thing is keeping food waste out of the landfill and regenerating our soil, regenerating our earth. Um, so I'm going to show you a couple other things that, well, actually I can leave the bucket finally. Here is where we store sawdust. Sawdust is a waste product that we get from uh, a, um, a sawmill or a wood mill. Um, that, that produces things from wood. And we use this in our compost toilet, which you'll see in a minute. And then uh, cardboard is another waste product that we use. We use this for sheet mulching for turning yards into gardens. And then here's all of our buckets for our community compost program, which today's Friday, so I actually have to head out and do our community compost program in a bit. Um, now I'm gonna take you over to Speaking of waste, I'm going to take you over to the uh, compost toilet. I think of this as a bit of a revolutionary thing for our society. You know, if you think about it, most people, they flush their poop, which we call waste, down the toilet and it becomes someone else's problem. And it is a problem. The way that we deal with our poop is a big problem that's causing serious issues for our waterways and depleting our soils. The compost toilet, on the other hand, is a solution. We turn this poop, all these nutrients, into fertile compost that we can actually grow food with. So we're taking the problem and turning it into a solution. And even better, what I love about this compost toilet is I actually grow my own toilet paper. This is one of my absolute favorite plants. This is Plecranthus barbatus or the blue spur flower among other names. And it's in the mint family. So first of all, this toilet paper has a really nice fragrance to it. But more importantly, it's very soft. In fact, it's one of the softest plants that I really know of. I mean, I mean, it's a great toilet paper, but now that I'm thinking about it, it's actually just a nice little wipe the sweat off the face because it's so soft. That's a new use for it. But it grows abundantly and, you know, it takes just a couple of sticks and then you have enough toilet paper for a whole family or a whole, a whole small community to be able to use. So it's a beautiful plant. And what's great about it, I'll show you if you want to come inside. We've got the compost toilet itself here. And the toilet paper sits right here. Now we also have your, you know, your standard toilet paper, but we do at least get a uh, more eco-friendly one than some of the stuff out there. 
but uh, I primarily just use this. And what's cool about this plant as well is it can sit here next to the toilet for up to a week after it comes off. So it's great for taking camping and things as well. So we have a basic system here. We've got pee and poop and then we've got sawdust. So in this one, you sit to go pee and then we use this water. Uh, it's, it's pee uh, in a bucket of water that's diluted and then we use that for watering the plants. Here, you go poop and then after you go poop, you uh, take a handful of sawdust and put that over the poop. And the key to a successful compost toilet is making sure that you use enough of a carbon material like sawdust that you cover it completely and it's dry. And I'm sitting in here and I have no smell at all. I could definitely talk about poop for a very long time, but all that to say, um, our poop, you know, doesn't go to the wastewater treatment plant. It is composted to make compost in order to be able to grow more food. And I think it's about time to get to the garden finally, which I'm sure some of you will be excited about. So out of the compost toilet to the garden. So this is the outdoor shower. My top preference for an outdoor shower is actually rainwater, but this is just hooked up to a hose, um, just using municipal water. But the beautiful thing about this outdoor shower is that rather than this going to a wastewater treatment plant, this water actually waters the plants as you shower. So as we're showering, we're growing turmeric, ginger, taro, and uh, these are some wonderful little Everglades tomatoes that I just harvested from ah, about three feet from the shower. And the shower is actually on an old stump that's sitting there. So it's a nice natural stump that you stand on, the shower raining down over you and then watering the garden at the same time. Um, so we also harvest rainwater off of the house to reduce the total amount of water that we're using from the city. Uh, we collect as much as we can from the house. We have rainwater harvesting on two of the four corners of the house and the more water that you can harvest, the more independent you can become of the systems that are sucking our wells and our rivers dry and no need for chemicals at all, just pure water coming from the sky. So there's two systems. We have the 55 gallon drums here. You can generally buy these for about 25 or $15. And then we have the 275 gallon IBC totes. This is my preferred method. Um, you know, it's about five of these drums equals one of these totes. And so 275 gallons goes a pretty long way. What I like about these is they actually have a spigot on the bottom, which opens wide up and you can fill five gallon buckets out of there like really quickly in order to be able to water the gardens. So rainwater harvesting is, is again, it's one of these things that some people think is really complicated, but we, you know, we just had downspouts and all I did to get the water into here is I got a chunk of a gutter and then I just strapped it onto there and I just directed it into this tote. So it's simply a matter of directing water into your whatever bins or buckets that you're storing water in. Rainwater harvesting can be very complex or it can be made very simple. Um, I'm going to show you the worm bin, which is one of the little pieces of magic that there is on the property. It's just right over here. I'm actually new to keeping worms. I just started this about three months ago and I learned from uh, a good friend of mine, Albert Reisenberg, who's really a pretty much a, a worm expert these days. Um, and what I'm going to show you is how to turn food waste like this, banana peels, into black gold like this. Super nutrient rich worm castings that are just work wonders on the garden. So you've got your food waste and that turns into this amazing stuff. So I only open the worms once a month and I feed them two buckets, two five gallon or so buckets of food waste. So let's take a look in here. I just open them up once a month on uh, about the full moon. And then just look at that. So we've got some sprouts here, but what you can see on the top here is what I'm talking about when I talk about this black gold. So that's just pure worm castings right on top, just right ready to harvest. 
And the system that Albert taught me is once a month adding two buckets of the right ideal food waste, which is really easy to di digest mild food for them. You pull this back, you put it down on the bottom. On the bottom you have bedding like um, nice fine wood chip stuff. And then you have your buckets of food waste and then you put this back over the top. So basically the worms actually put most of their castings at the top. They poop at the top and then you're able to harvest this black gold worm castings right off the top. So we're talking another way that on this little homestead we're turning a wasted resource, something other people don't want, into a really just beautiful resource for growing food. All right, so now it's time to finally show you the garden, which I know is something that probably a lot of you are the most excited about and something that I'm the most excited about. And one of the greatest parts about homesteading is breaking free from the global industrial food system and actually growing our own food and growing an abundance of it right on site where we can share it with our family, our friends, and our community. So to start with, this is uh, one of the herb gardens. We've got four different types of basil, African blue basil, Thai basil, columnar basil, your standard Genovese basil. We've got Cuban oregano and your standard oregano. We've got mint and we've got lemon balm. And over here we've got wonderful lemongrass. I have this situated right next to the back porch. The reason being is this is the easiest access to the kitchen. Great place to put your herb garden is as close to the kitchen as possible so you can always come out and get fresh herbs. So one of the herb gardens here. Um, moving over here, this is our turmeric and ginger garden as well as taro and malanga. So we have nine different varieties of turmeric and ginger here and turmeric and ginger are pretty easy to grow in Florida. The focus of all these gardens is to grow what grows really easily. The things that don't have a lot of pests, the things that can handle droughts, the things that really take care of themselves and uh, we focus a lot on perennials rather than annuals. Coming this way, um, one thing you'll notice is that our raised beds use logs rather than rather than buying materials we're using uh, we cut down some trees on the property in order to um, let in some sunlight and we use those to make our beds so in here we have a lot more lemongrass come on over we've got uh, we've got a lot of papaya that grows really well here different perennial spinaches over here is the, the Everglades tomato that I mentioned. Here is a habanero pepper that's growing. Nice hot spicy pepper. And then we've got amaranths. Behind me is moringa. So this is one of the most special, most important plants to have on site when you are in a semi-tropical place. And the key to growing food is to work within your environment. If you're watching this video and you're in Wisconsin or New York or Washington, you can grow an abundance of food there. It's just not necessarily gonna be the same things that are being grown here. Um, over here you can see the bananas. Um, what's key is to think plants that need a lot of water. Those are located right next to the rainwater harvesting because the overflow can go to there. So I'm gonna take you uh, over to the side of the house where we have a living wall fence and then out to the front of the house. So here we've created a living fence and you'll notice on the other side of this fence, there's a lot growing as well. So the six months that I've been here, I've actually done a work exchange and I've permacultured out both of these properties in exchange for the rent here. Um, what we have going here is lufa squashes, which you can eat these when they're young, like a zucchini, or you can wait till they get older, dried out, and then you actually get sponges, and then you can use these for washing dishes, washing your compost buckets. Again, this garden is developing. It's on the younger side, but we've got grapes, and if you come on down a little further, um, there is passion fruit growing over here as well. And so the idea is to create a living, beautiful fence that's actually producing food. So using vertical space is one of the keys to producing a lot of food in urban or suburban environments often. So yeah, we'll keep on heading up to the front. 
So we are in the front yard garden and it's summertime in Florida and so one of the things that I do usually is I grow cover crops. So I have amaranth here, I have a couple of types of amaranth. I've got my sweet potato which produces delicious greens as well as big fat sweet potatoes. And then I've got southern peas. All of these cover the ground for the heat of the summer and can tolerate and thrive in the heat of the summer. So that's what I generally do in the summer is I have my cover crops. Um, over here, this is the beginning of a banana circle and the downspout behind me actually comes under the ground and uh, dumps the water out there. So that's a passive form of rainwater harvesting. The front of the house is really designed for the community, to bring in the community, to interact with the community, and to be of service to the community. This is the community compost drop-off site. So for people that want to compost, uh, we give them a clean bucket and they fill it with their food scraps and then they can swap it out for a clean one and bring their food scraps for us to compost. We also have a bicycle powered compost program where we swap out buckets with people who are filling their bucket with food scrap in the community. Here is a uh, community fruit tree. People can come and freely access the fruit um, and the idea is to help people see that fruit can be growing freely and abundantly all around us. And then if you come right over here this is the free seed library and we have put 11 of these up into the community um, if you want to come take a look at it we have uh, we have 12 different seeds that are ideal for the growing conditions right now that are available and then down here is a seed exchange where people can add their own seeds so the idea of the free seed library is to provide seeds to people to help them grow their own food to empower them um, and to help them take that next step towards food sovereignty and then what you'll see all around is this whole front yard is full of wildflowers and the idea is that this is a pollinator friendly bee and butterfly area to bring in pollinators and to provide habitat for other important species as well as I mean flowers in the front yard is a really beautiful place to have them um, and then we're going to end right at the beautiful magnolia tree which is kind of oh actually before that right here this is one of the this is part of the free seed project demonstration garden so everything that's growing in here are uh, seeds that come through our free seed packs um, and so this is the basil pack there's five different types of basil growing in here all right so this is the magnolia tree that sits right in the front of the yard and it's, uh, it really is one of the most peaceful spots. The, uh, the shade that's casted here makes it the coolest spot of the yard and I can sit out here and uh, really just enjoy the shade. And whew, gotta be honest, that was a long tour. Um, it took about four hours to film this just now so I'm feeling, feeling a little bit exhausted but I'm so happy to have been able to share this place with you Again, this, is, uh, this place is six months. So this is a, a, an example of what can be done in just six months time. Now, there was a lot of help, a lot of volunteers that went into creating this, a whole team of people that lived here that helped create this place. And it takes time and it takes work to create something like this, but it, it is possible to step away from this consumeristic model and live in a more sustainable, more communal, uh, more at service to the community way. Well, the truth is that, of course, this is not sustainable. Um, the whole world could not possibly live this way. This still consumes too much resources, but it is so much less destructive than the mainstream way of living. So there's so much that we can do to shift our lifestyles. And one thing I just want to talk a little bit about is that it took a community to bring this together and I, I give so much thanks to every single person who was a part of this and also at the same time want to apologize because this was an incredible amount of work and um, my, biggest, my biggest task this year, what this year has turned out to be so far, this six months, has been learning um, to work with others. It's been learning to live in a communal way and that's been hard for me. And so working with a team and living together in this place has been really one of, the, one of the most difficult things I've done in quite some time. I've definitely been taking feedback and I've definitely been uh, working to get better at, uh, at um, 
communication that uh, leaves everybody uplifted rather than you know uh, feeling exhausted and uh, and the opposite of uplift uplifted sometimes so that being said you know communal living is hard I have really yet to find a place where it just flows easily uh, even places that have been around for decades communities that have been around a decades uh, it's really difficult so I just want to give that little bit of uh, you know advice and knowledge on that is that it's definitely far from all um, easy. It's definitely far from, from like getting out of the rat race just results in bliss. No, um, life is hard. Life takes work no matter which way that you're doing it. And living in a more communal way, living in harmony with the earth, um, it takes going against the grain of society. Um, and it takes really deeply self-reflecting on the way that we interact with other people, with other species and this earth. So it's, you know, it's a it's a it's a road you know and it's a it's a tough road but it's a worthwhile road in order to, to shift our ways but again one bit at a time it's not a matter of getting to the point of a regenerative regenerative lifestyle overnight it's work and it's one bit at a time and so I encourage you whatever you've learned today what you've been inspired by start taking those things into your life start adapting start changing one bit at a time to live in a more equitable just and sustainable way so I love you all so much. I'm glad that we got to spend this time together and there will be many more videos to come. So make sure you just subscribe to this channel. And if you want this information to get out in the world, make sure to comment and like the video as well. And of course, share it with friends if you'd like to. So yeah, love you all very much and I'll see you again soon.